It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Deborah Davis, one of the world's leading and accom accomplished and prolific cancer epidemiologists and toxicologists. And what a gift it is that Living Web Farms would sponsor her visit in Asheville. Thank you. Dr. Davis, who comes to us from Teton Village, Wyoming, holds a Bachelor of Science and a Master's in Sociology from the University of Pittsburgh, a PhD in Science Studies from the University of Chicago, and a postdoctoral Master's in Public Health from Johns Hopkins University. At the University of Pittsburgh, she was founding director of the Center for Environmental Oncology and also professor of epidemiology at their School of Public Health. For the National Sciences Foundation, she was the, director, the founding director of the Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology, where she organized the analysis that led to that ban on smoking in, in airplanes that we take for granted so many years later. Among Dr. Davis's many accomplishments, she was given the Breast Cancer Awareness Award by the Betty Ford Comprehensive Cancer Center and the American Cancer Society. She was a member of the team of scientists awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for their climate change research along with the Honorable Al Gore in 2007. Currently, Dr. Davis is a visiting professor of medicine at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and the Mayas University Medical School in Turkey. She is the founder and president of the Environmental Health Trust, a nonprofit that provides research and education on environmental health hazards and promotes constructive policies locally, nationally, and internationally. During her 45-year career, Dr. Davis has written more than 220 publications and three award-winning books, including When Smoke Ran Like Water, The Secret History of the War on Cancer, and Disconnect, The Truth About Cell Phone Radiation. Malaprops is in the back, and they will be selling all of those three books after um, our program during the break. Here in North Carolina, Dr. Davis has been a tremendous help to our efforts with Safe Tech Kids NC in our efforts to raise awareness about the health effects of wireless radiation. She presented to the governor's office two years ago during the 5G legislation. During this, uh, this past March, Dr. Davis presented to leaders of our state health department, which set in motion some important changes in our local government's ability to understand and to create change around the hazards of wireless radiation. We can tell you more about our efforts in North Carolina on this change, and we can talk to you about the break, at the break about that. In my five years of studying Dr. Davis's work, I have witnessed many times her gift of taking complex science, making it real and relevant for her audience, and teaching concrete ways to reduce our risks of environmental toxins every day. She is the most brave and brilliant woman that I know. So whether you are here because of your concern about our food supply, our pollinators, or the people you love, Dr. Davis has much to, to share with us that will easily apply to your everyday life. Please join me in a warm welcome of Dr. Deborah Davis. Thank you. Thank you all for coming on this beautiful day where we have to uh, adjust to the radical changes in weather that are no longer uh, something we can take for granted anymore. We've got um, quite a lot of information I want to share with you this afternoon. So without further ado, I'm going to launch right into it. I must say it's a thrill for me to be in Asheville where so many of you are here because you care about your health because you love the environment. And what I want to talk with you about today is a grave environmental pollution problem that has generally eluded public attention with the notable exception of what our colleagues are doing here in Asheville, which warms my heart, the work of what 5G Coalition here and others working on wireless safe kids, as Marianne just told you. 
and hopefully Meredith will be talking about it soon in a program at the, at the farm. Well, reducing environmental toxins. Why we need to reduce environmental toxins is because we have to understand the importance of learning from the past. If we want the future for our children and grandchildren to be better than the past, we have to study it. And that's what I've done in many of my books uh, that are available for you today. When Smoke Ran Like Water, which did get a National Book Award finalist, which was a very <clears throat> worrisome thing, because when your first book gets a National Book Award, then everything else after that is a failure. Um, but I was very pleased to be able to write this book because it was really about my life. I grew up with a grandmother who, long before she was my age, was in bed all the time. And I, as a young child, two or three, I remember the first time I met someone who had a grandmother that wasn't in bed. And I thought, oh, aren't grandmothers supposed to be in bed? <laughs> my grandmother was in bed because she had had many, many heart attacks. She came to Denora, Pennsylvania, the Monongahela Valley, very strong. She was the first woman to hand crank a Model T. So she was a tough woman, but I never knew that. I only knew her as a sick old lady who was too frail to go to the um, beauty parlor so the hairdressers would come door to door to take care of dozens of women like her who had been rendered so ill by the polluted air around them. This was a picture, I think it might have been Ansel Adams, I can't find, I found it in the Library of Congress, but it was bragging about the prosperity in Pittsburgh and the prosperity in Donora. Donora, Pennsylvania, my small town, along a bend of the Monongahela River, burned more coal in one day than the entire city of Pittsburgh, which was five times as large, because they needed all that coal to make coke for the coke ovens, to, burn, to fuel the blast furnace, and to fuel our homes, which were heated with coal stoves, by the way. So this is a video that will show you what it was like, because it's hard Hard to believe. It looked like the foggiest day that you could imagine. What happened is the smoke couldn't go up. It couldn't dissipate. They were uh, panting and they were scared to death. People became aware that uh, there were a lot of people dying. And it was, unfortunately, a recipe for a disaster. Let's go to press. Denora, Pennsylvania. Health officials now fear an ammonia epidemic in Denora, where the death toll from a smothering fog has reached 20. It was the fall of 1948 when that deadly smog descended on Denora. Toxic fumes from a zinc plant and other nearby mills hung over the area for five days. When rain finally cleared the air, 20 people had died. Thousands more were sickened. Today, most people don't know about the Denora smog. Some know it as a footnote in history, and very few know how the tragedy changed the way we live and breathe, except for those who lived through it. Just can't get over the green over there in Webster on top of the hill. Everything was dark brown, yeah. was dirt. Yep. Jean Davis actually, is back home. She hasn't seen Denora in decades. Jean raised her family there and returned with her daughter, Deborah, for a look at the old neighborhood. I remember the house was there where your mom lived and she They got talk sick. about the Donora it's of yesterday. We all grew up there. They remember life in a small town settled on the steep hills above the Monongahela River. You know, I used to walk up and down these steps four times a day to go to Kastner School on 10th Street. How many steps were there? 105. 105. Why'd you keep counting them? I don't know. I guess it helped pass the time. Well, <clears throat> that's what my hometown was like. And uh, there will be a few video excerpts. Uh, may I ask, how many of you had ever heard of the town of Denora, Pennsylvania, before today? 
well, then you must have been following my work because <laughs> most people, it's, it's really a, a tragedy that most people have no idea that that's where air pollution really started. Air pollution control started when people realized that a massive amount of air pollution could kill people and began to ask the question about what about the non-lethal aspects of air pollution, which we know very well today are quite substantial. So I was a toddler when that incident happened. And when I grew up, um, not when I went away to school, I wasn't really grown up, I came home one day and I said to my mother, Mom, was there another town with the same name as ours? And she said, why are you asking? I said, well, I read in a book at school that there was a town called Donora, and it was polluted. Was there another Donora? I thought maybe it was you know, in Mexico or something. I wasn't fully you know, paying attention. And she said, well, do you remember how the sun didn't shine for days at a time? I said, yeah. Remember how we used to have to clean the walls down twice a year because they would get so much coal dust on them? I said, well, sure. And I was young. I got to help because I was tall. She said, well, I think today they would call that pollution. But back then, it was just a living. And uh, that's the reality of how I grew up. And I, my grandmother had so many heart attacks that I saw that when she had her last one, her 25th, and she didn't make it back, I, I couldn't believe it. And uh, that was just the reality of life in a small um, steel town where the whole world revolved about that mill. Now, the Industrial Revolution was fueled by a number of things. And one of them was leaded gasoline. And I just want to share with you this ad because we have to recognize that sometimes the advertising industry has not played the most constructive role in our society. And this is one of them. When the lead industry realized it was going to have a problem persuading people to put this toxic heavy metal into gasoline, they created a character named Ethel. See? She's kind of saucy looking. She kind of looks like a maybe one of those flappers that was very fat, fashionable back then. And in case there's any question about it, you can fill your tank with her <clears throat> and get high compression. So this early use of uh, sex to sell things, it was right there. And who didn't want more compression in your engine? And who were the people buying the fuels? Of course, it was men for the most part. And maybe they found it attractive to think they had Ethel with them. But they didn't tell you her full name. Her full name was Tetra Ethel Lead. And lead, of course, is a toxic heavy metal. And we know there is no safe level. And further, we know that the younger in age exposure takes place, the more damage to the central nervous system. And even though there were scientists that warned about this at the time, they were ignored. So I talk about this in my smoke book in some detail and talk about this woman, Mary Amder. She measured lead and gasoline exhaust in 1953. Now listen to this. They literally said there was no lead in gasoline exhaust. Do you know why? They couldn't measure it. So therefore, it didn't exist. Mary Amder was a Scotswoman, a very brilliant engineer and scientist. And she figured out how to measure lead in gasoline. And she, it was a real tremendous breakthrough. The sort of thing that if she had been a man and it had been a different time, she might have received a Nobel for the work. Mary Amder not only did not receive a Nobel, she ended up losing her job because she refused to back down. She went to a meeting, and I describe this in de detail in my book, to present these data. And when she got in an elevator, and she was a small woman, two guys in leather jackets got on. And I know this story because two different people told it to me, the same story. And they said, Mary, you're not going to talk about that lead stuff today, are you? And she ignored them, got off the elevator, and went to give her talk, 
which she did deliver. When she got back to her job at Harvard, no less, a woman at Harvard back then was quite a big deal, she was fired. She was fired. Now, it turns out Mary Amder and I have a few things in common, one of which is that we don't back down, another one of which is we were born in Donora, and another one of which is that we each saw our relatives sickened from pollution. And I like to think that some of the work I do is in honor of her spirit and her memory. Now, in The Secret History of the War on Cancer, I talk more about <clears throat> what went wrong with the war on cancer. In case you think it hasn't gone wrong, let me just give you a few statistics. There has been no fundamental improvement in our ability to treat the most deadly forms of cancer like brain and pancreas and liver. Yes, it's true, we can find things earlier and earlier. And if you find them really early, sometimes you can eventuate a cure. But for the most part, we have not seen any dramatic improvement in survival. And for those people who are poor, for those people who are not in the United States, even ordinary cancers that we can treat here are a death sentence, a death sentence. And now there are shortages of drugs because some of them are not profitable enough. And you can spend $10,000, $20,000 a month for cancer treatments. And the United States spends more for cancer than any other country in the world today per patient. And we do not have any better survival overall than other countries. So we have created the wrong war with the wrong weapons, fighting the wrong enemies. Because the war on cancer gets started and people are talking about finding the disease and treating it, but they're not talking about tobacco. Remember, this is in the 70s. They're not talking about asbestos. They're not talking about benzene. They're not talking about x-rays. And all of them were known to cause cancer when this war was launched. And that's why I say we fought the wrong war with the wrong weapons. Thanks to Living Web Farms and other people working in this realm nowadays, we know there are many things we can do to reduce our risk of cancer, starting with re reducing our burden of toxic materials in our bodies. The ionizing radiation issue is a fascinating one that I document in, in the Secret History book because it was discovered at the turn of the 20th century at the turn of the 20th century, that's when ionizing radiation was discovered, and within a few years, it was being used around the world. It was the first global discovery because it was shared uh, with male being able to transmit the images of the X-ray of Frau Berta Renken, which is in my book, where she, her ring finger was X-rayed. She thought it was a death ray, as did many others, and refused to have another x-ray again. She also had no children. And she and her husband, the inventor of x-rays, slept in the room right below where his laboratory was with all of the radiation that would have been bouncing around. Edison is known as a very renowned American inventor. Actually, he didn't invent nearly as much. He took other people's ideas and developed them. He was a good businessman. But he also personally refused to have an x-ray. Although he didn't mind having his laboratory assistants use x-rays. And so this poor fellow here was his lab assistant, Clarence Daly. He died, literally, amputations from massive radiation poisoning. And so it was a very early indication that radiation could be very dangerous and toxic. In addition, there, I tell the story in my book of the radium dowel painters, all women, who would paint, you remember those uh, watches where you could see them light up in the dark? That's radiation. That's a small amount of radiation. Nowadays, they have other materials. But back then, in the old days, it was radiate. And these women would narrow the paintbrush with their mouth, as painters did back then. And they lost their jaws. They lost their jaws. They lost their mouths, basically. And that became known also very early on. And yet, 
the precautions about radiation, even for the technologists who were giving people x-rays, were not really widely undertaken until far too long. Now, one of the things I could say about the war on cancer is that there were a lot of conflicts of interest that were not widely known, and here's just one of them. See that fellow there with that nice cheery smile? He was the head of the American Cancer Society. That is a tobacco pipe, right? And he's lighting it. And that is a cover of, I didn't make it up. It's for real. He left the American Cancer Society, where he had been the founding director, and he turned it into a very, an interesting group that never looked at the hazards of tobacco. Okay, that was, the American Cancer Society never looked at the hazards of tobacco. He became the founding director of the tobacco research group. And the tobacco industry research group sounds like Today, we'd think, oh, that's terrible. But back then, it was one of the only sources of funding for scientific research. And it had a great deal of credibility. And people loved working. They loved working for tobacco money because it was real money. And I'm talking about Harvard and Yale and Princeton. And in the book, I document that the National Cancer Institute received $10 million from the tobacco industry research group in order to make a safe cigarette in the 1970s, the director of the National Cancer Institute was a four-pack-a-day smoker. I'm not making that up. So we had some conflicts of interest, shall we say. One of them, I won't go into great detail, but I do in, talk about much more in detail in the book, has to do with the fact that Willem Hooper was a brilliant basic scientist and physician from Germany. And he was convinced from his work in Germany that there were a number of things in the workplace that cause cancer in workers. He did a study of dyes in the dye industry, and he showed that the longer workers worked in dyes, the more of them had bladder cancer. And that by the end of 20 years, 100% of all the workers who were still alive had bladder cancer. That's his work, okay? He came to the United States in the 30s, a terrible time in Germany, terrible time in the world. And at first, he got, him, he got a job, ultimately, uh, working for DuPont. He was thrilled. He believed that they really wanted to know the answers to questions. And as I reveal in my book, that was not at all what they wanted. They wanted him to be kind of window dressing to show that they had a scientist working for them but they didn't really take seriously the issue of the environment. Well, unbeknownst to Hooper, as I document in my book, there was a fellow named Robert Kehoe. There are buildings named after Kehoe today at the University of Cincinnati. Kehoe was in the US Army. He was a part of the Secret Service. He was assigned to go into Germany right after the war, and he took under into his possession, this fellow you see the picture of there, which I found in his archives, Ferdinand Fleury. Now, Ferdinand Fleury was one of the fathers of chemical warfare. Chemical warfare is using chemicals to kill people. That means you understand a lot about what they do to people. Well, Hooper ended up being supervised by Kehoe, but he never knew it until shortly before he died. Every piece of work he did for the National Institute uh, of Health, National Cancer Institute, every report he ever did was sent to Kehoe for Kehoe to decide whether it should be released or not. And he never could figure out why he had a hard time getting his reports released. He learned shortly before he died that he had a minder, if you will, that he, there was somebody else. So while the work appeared to be independent, for the U.S. government no less, this is the U.S. government giving research reports to DuPont to see whether they should be published. Another example of the radiation issue, I was privileged to meet this wonderful woman, Dr. Alice Stewart. She was about six feet tall. She came from a family of women physicians. Her mother had been a physician. She was a physician in Britain. And she had the outrageous idea to look at women who were mothers of children with leukemia and ask them what 
did you do during your pregnancy? She actually interviewed women to find out what had happened to them. And she made a very important discovery. She revealed that while pregnant, they had been subjected to x-rays. And she found a clear association with the more x-rays a woman had had, the greater the risk her baby would have leukemia. And she reported this. And the establishment didn't want to believe it. And it, she was opposed by many people who worked for the UK National Radiation Protection Board. And their job was to protect radiation, not to protect people. Although you thought they were doing both. And at those days, they allowed much higher levels of radiation than we would today. And she was hounded and discredited. But in fact, today, her findings are well established as clearly clear evidence of harm. And I just want to take a moment and, and draw your attention to the last two columns here. This is something I calculated in 2007, looking at the amount of radiation to the head on the first two or to the abdominal area for a baby and equivalency in chest x-rays. And you see that last column there? 400 to 6,000 chest x-rays for a baby head CT, 200 to 3,000, depending if it's f adjusted for the brain. Now, why was that possible? Because in the days when I was doing this calculation, which was not that long ago, right? We're talking about in the 2000s, CT machines were not always adjusted for the body size of the patient. And the failure to do that meant that you were giving these, and we're talking infants sometimes, right? Three months, four months. They would get massive amounts of radiation. And this may be why we are seeing some increases in cancer in children today. Fortunately, when I was at the Cancer Institute and at the University of Pittsburgh, my colleagues there in radiology, I went up to them one, and I said, guys, did I make a mistake? I'm looking at the arithmetic here. Is this, there's something wrong, right? This, this can't be true. And they said, no, it's true. I said, what, what the hell are you doing about this? They said, well, we have a white paper. And they did issue a white paper. And their white paper calls for a concept that I want to share with you today because I think we should embrace it broadly. And it's the concept of as low as reasonably achievable. So we have technology, and we need it for certain things. But we want our exposures to be as low as reasonably achievable. And that is, in fact, the standard for the pediatric CT scans. That is the standard that we need to ask for in general for exposures to other devices as well. And hopefully, if, if anybody has a young child that's unconscious, that absolutely needs a CT scan, your pediatricians and radiologists now know this. But back then, they did not. A similar issue, a similar dark issue, uh, it has to do with a pesticide called DBCP. Has anyone ever heard of it? It's dibromochloropropane. And this was a miracle pesticide because you could throw it in the water and fish would die, so you could eat the fish. <clears throat> you, it was really, really effective on strawberries and pineapple, so it was very widely used in the tropics. Well, there's only one problem. Before it was used, when it was being researched, one of the researchers that I discovered when I went back and looked at the archives, in 1961 wa warned that if you use this, you were going to get testicular atrophy. The animals exposed to one part per million got testicular atrophy. That means that their testes were shrunken. That's a pretty serious effect, right? It really is. Because the testes are more vulnerable than almost any other part of the human body because they are outside, women have the ovaries inside. That is what Diderot said made the difference between men and women. The bags of the men were out, the bags of the women were in. But in fact, by having the bags out, so to speak, the testes of the men, the testicular so-called barrier, is more sensitive than any other part of the human body. And Torvalson warned about this in a report to Shell and Dow. And nobody paid attention to it until, until, in 1977, a group of guys are sitting around a ball field in Colorado. And they say, you know, we got a problem. They're talking to one another. And they discover that all of them have been trying to get their wives pregnant. And they all had been not doing well. As one of them said, we've been shooting blanks. 
because their sperm got tested and was found to be very deficient. Some of them had almost no sperm at all, no viable sperm. That is an interesting story uh, in the way regulations developed, certainly back then and probably now, unfortunately, too. At that time, I worked for the administrator of EPA. And I remember the reaction when we got this report that there's a group of guys that are sterile from using this pesticide. And the administrator, a guy, of course, said, we, well, we better do something about this. <laughs> and that pesticide got regulated faster than anything I've ever seen. Anything. Okay? Whereas we're still talking about things like dioxin and methylene chloride and bisphenol A and phthalates and whatever else you want to put on the questioning now by this administration. But DBCP was banned the same year that these guys reported that they had all become sterile. Now in Costa Rica, 20,000 had become affected and because of that, lawsuits were filed and they were won and because of that, they were one in Texas, and so what did Texas do? It changed the law. So you cannot, as a, as a foreign wronged person, you can no longer sue in Texas. And you can still, unfortunately, find DBCP in drinking water in some areas where it's been used. So that's a sorry part of the history. <laughs>